Okay, um, so today I'm going to give a very brief and not very well prepared talk about JDK 9, and then Victor is going to just uh, catch you guys up on what happened at Scala World, which is a conference we both went to this week. So Java 9 was released for general availability yesterday. Um, been a long road to get there, I think. Can't remember when Java 8 came out, but it was quite a while ago. So there's the big feature of Java 9 is modules, this thing called Project Jigsaw. So I'll go into that a little bit. But probably the most exciting feature is that it now has a REPL. So this thing called JShell. So if you've been using Scala, like most of us have, this isn't that exciting. We already have two REPLs. But finally, Java gets one as well. So you can now do stuff in the REPL. Um, and obviously, you can like import things and whatever. You can do all the normal Java stuff. Uh, it took me a while to work out how to get out of it. I was doing exits and control T and quit and buy, but control D is the answer. Uh, oh, yeah, let's quickly go back into the REPL. So, the next feature of Java 9, which I found quietly pleasing, is that uh, collections finally have factory methods. So, you can do like list dot of one, two, three, which is not that exciting if you're used to Scala, but at least now when we have to do interop with Java, it'll be slightly less painful. You can just make lists and sets and things a little bit more easily. Um, a slightly bigger feature is that there's now a, um, an HTTP client, a proper one, in the standard library. Um, so that means you can make HTTP calls and without having to add any more dependencies. It's just it's there in the standard lib, which is quite nice. Uh, so I had a quick play around with that. actually struggled to write 10 lines of Java this morning. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty standard um, Java-ish library with kind of fluent interfaces and builders and things. Um, not too exciting. It's, it's HTTP2, which is quite interesting. But apart, other than that, it's pretty standard. Um, you can see here, I'm handling the body as a string, but you could plug in your own custom body handler to decode it as JSON or whatever. Um, it also has send, which is locking, and send east, async, which returns a future. So you can choose between those. Um, just to prove that it works. Compile it. Um, so when you compile it, I have to add this module thing, which I'll come on to in a second when I talk about modules. But basically, this HTTP client is not quite ready for prime time yet. So they've made it this so-called incubator module. So you need to add it specifically. It's not quite in the standard lib yet. So compile it and then run it as standard. And you need to add the module both at compile time and at runtime. And there it's gone and got some random JSON from the internet. Uh, so the, the final thing is the big one, the module system. Um, I read, or rather watched, a really good video about it this morning, this keynote by Mark Reinhold, who's, I think, the project lead for this whole module system. This is a talk he gave last year, I think, a couple of years ago. So it's slightly out of date, but mostly correct, I think. Um, it's only half an hour, and it gives a nice overview of the whole module system. So it's, I'd recommend this video. But anyway, um, this is what he says a module is. So it's a container of packages. So up until now, Java has had classes, and then you can group classes into packages. But now there's another level. You can group, group packages into modules. So it's a container of packages. It names the modules upon which it depends. So you make explicit the dependencies between your modules. Um, 
and it also makes explicit which packages it exports for use by other modules. So you can have a bunch of internal packages that you need to use within your module, but nobody else is allowed to use them. They're private, which is not something you were able to do until now. If you have a jar, then there's no kind of concept of public and private or internal APIs. You can just access anything you like. Um, so that's what a module is. You define a module using this new file called module info.java. It looks like this. So you give your module a name, which generally looks like a package name, that kind of dotted syntax. You can say which modules it requires. So this is your things that you depend on. Um, and you can say which packages you export. So this is one package that I'm exporting. Um, and then the compiler will look at the module info.java file. It'll look at all your requires. It'll go and find those, those modules. It'll see what they require and build up the whole kind of transitive graph of all the modules that you transitively depend on. It'll check that they all actually exist at compile time. So you can't require something that doesn't exist. Um, and then at runtime, it'll do the same check, but it'll do it when the JVM starts up. So instead of like class get not found error after your app has been running for three days, it'll actually fail fast at startup, which is quite nice. Um, so what you do with this thing, this module definition, is you actually compile it. So you do Java C. I need to add that, that special extra package. But anyway, you compile it, and it turns it into a, a special class file. So it's a normal dot class file, but the contents are a bit different from a normal one. So that's how you use these module things. And the other big part of this module story is that they've modularized the JDK itself. So now it's split up into about 20 different modules, I think. So you can, I think by default, they're all turned on. But if you want to, you can slim it down to only the modules you actually need to use. So if you're not using like java.xml or whatever, you just strip it out and you can link them together. There's this uh, command line tool called jlink, which will look at only look at your module dependencies and kind of build this blob of this image of your app plus the bits of the JDK it needs. And then you can deploy that as to a Docker container or whatever. So that's pretty cool. But the big thing that I found this module system doesn't do, which I was a bit disappointed about, doesn't seem to have any support for multiple versions of the same library. Because often we have version conflict problems on the class path, where you've got like loads of dependencies, and they've got loads of transitive dependencies. And somewhere in this big graph, you've got like, uh, I don't know, like uh, SLF4J 1.3 over here, and 1.7 over here. and uh, you have to pick one of them to go on the class path, and something's going to break. It's all very fragile. And this doesn't really seem to solve that problem. I can't really see any way where you could have both of those on your class path or your module path, and they would be nicely isolated from each other, which is a bit of a shame. But it seems that that's like a deliberate design decision that they decided not to tackle that problem. Um, okay, I think that's all I know about Java 9. Do you have any questions? So the, um, the, the requires, like, it's quite small, right? Like, it's not like a module requires a new line. Do I have access to those without, like, specifying my own? Does that make sense? Yes, I think you do, which I thought was so also a bit disappointing. Like, last problem app, right? Like, yeah. If I was designing this, I would say you're only allowed to access packages you actually yeah. explicitly required. But maybe that's just really annoying to write them all out. I don't know. How did the OSGI community react to the fact that the module I don't know. Um, I'm, I hope they consulted them, <laughs> because it's quite <laughs> similar, isn't it? Uh, I know that this module thing was rejected once, not very long ago. It went through a voting process, and they 
it got vetoed, but I guess it recovered from that. It finally got released. I haven't really been paying that much attention to JDK 9 until yesterday when it came out. So. Okay, uh, next up is Victor. Do you want to Yeah, sure. Shall I just open up the website? So instead of picking topics for you guys, you just show me the chat and you say what you want to hear about. We'll give you a. We'll tell you something, hopefully, if our memory remembers or allows us. We'll put it in a font you can actually read. Do you want to hear about the shuttle bus? So I will slowly scroll down until somebody stops me. Where was it? It's in the lift district in Pender, or just outside. Not three hour train from here. Do you want to come a bit closer to me? Nice. <laughs> 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 I mean, some of these things are just a bit too late for the road. I want to hear more about them. I'm hoping it can. Oh, yeah. Can you can give like a very short description? Well, I'm Rather than yeah. opening Keynote, the most important thing about this is the name underneath it. Okay. Think. Do you want to describe this? Not really. Okay. Um, he was talking about, like, if you could design a language, like a programming language, in a way that you could create awesome IDE support for it, what kind of features would you keep and what would you remove, like, if you took an existing language? Um, it was very deeply technical, I would say. Yeah, mathematical. It's very it's mathematical, it. even. And uh, yeah, what I remember, what was really pain to handle was multi line comments. Mm. That's one of the features that's really hard to do properly or fast, rather. And an ID. And braces as well. And braces, yeah. Something I'd never really thought about is the fact that if you have a language that's based on indentation, it's much easier to parse than one that's based on like blocks of things using curly braces. So if you if the, the program is kind of syntactically wrong because you're halfway through writing it, then if you've got an opening brace somewhere, then your parser just explodes, just gives up. But if you're using indentation to mark blocks of things, then it, it can handle these kind of situations much better. Um, it was nested comments, wasn't it? Was the problem? Yes. So everything was basically in Haskell. This is uh, Haskell, yeah. Even suggesting to rename it to Haskell. Um, <laughs> but in Haskell, you, yeah, I, I don't know much about it, but you can basically have a, a multi line comment and you can have multi line comment inside a multi line comment. Things like that, right? Yeah. Which is hard to do apparently. Tell us about the exploring decision tree. Anyone attended that? Yeah, we will go over that. I'll start. Okay. Um, so it was a way to explain Matroshka, which is this library that's to do with recursion schemes, which is quite hard to explain, but uh, it's like a way of separating mechanics of recursing into a data structure from the kind of the business logic that you want to do at each level of that data structure. So if you're like, Mapping a function over a list is kind of similar if you squint to mapping a function over a tree or any other recursive thing. So the idea of recursion schemes is to kind of abstract that away for you. So you just think about the actual thing you're trying to map. But that's really hard to explain in the abstract. So she had quite a nice kind of concrete example for why you'd want to do this. It was this kind of data science based example about building a decision tree to try to predict what kind of people are going to survive on the Titanic. So like, 
if you are male and you have a first class ticket and you have no children with you, then you are more likely to die, that kind of stuff. So it was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, the problem made presentation a lot better, I think. Yeah. yeah it's a good example to work with. It's Lambda Core Hardcore. I don't really know <laughs> what it was about, but the guy was a wizard, I think. He was definitely dressed like a wizard. Yeah. Claims to be a wizard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Except when he went to the bathroom. Yes. Yeah. He was only a wizard outside of the bathroom. That question. But he was like explaining the Lambda calculus from first principles. But I don't really know what he was doing with his computer. It was, a, it was magic. Sometimes he was typing, sometimes it was just typing for itself. He seemed to be using his watch to, to compile the code. He was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a watch yeah. when the video comes up. It's very awesome. Which one? Uh, I think I watched half of that. But the dot is the, like the underlying theoretical foundations on which they're building the next version of the Scala compiler, which you know as Dottie. Um, so she was part of the team that did that. Yeah. And she was talking around like the limitations and what isn't in the theoretical foundation, but you have to consider in Scala or in Dolly. She um, gave some nice examples of how this type system is unsound in Scala. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And how easy it is to fool the Scala compiler. Yeah. Yeah, I think she went quite, into quite a lot of details on how you can construct bad bounds, which is where you basically say, you have a type T that is like a subtype of nothing, but a super type of any. So you get like a <laughs> the compiler to think there is a type that can't technically exist. Uh, Which means you can cast anything into anything. Yeah. Like. Which is basically made possible by a null, I think. So yeah, that the null is the culprit. Yeah, the null. The root of all And they so don't. Yeah, I think so. That's one way you can generate yeah. these bad numbers. This describing data with free applicative functors and higher order fixed point base types was fun. It was the most mind bending of the whole conference, I think, for me anyway. Yeah. Um, some very exciting type signatures on those slides, if you're into type signatures. It's like higher order, higher order. Yeah, so you just kept on saying, what happens if we take it one level higher? <laughs> Should we just go through all the ones we saw? Yeah. So, simplicity and composition. Uh, I don't really know how to describe this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bit of a weird one for me. It talked about basically functional programming uh, foundations and like trying to express uh, why composition matters so much. Mm -hmm. I think in a sense, like showing how type classes work, why it's why you need certain properties for them to be useful. It's like a stealthy introduction to category theory, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. You think you're talking about functional programming, but boom, it was actually category yeah. theory all along. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. How to build a functional programming API. This is Julian who makes the Monocle library. Um, this was quite nice. Just kind of a few simple tips on API design in a kind of functional style. So he went through an example of building something that parses stuff out of Excel spreadsheets. There's this Apache POI library that can interact with Excel spreadsheets and he was writing a parser on top of that. It's quite nice. Yeah, I think that's a really good one to watch on your own. Like if you 
I try to write more functional code or see how it can be done, that's probably a really good. Yeah, it's very accessible. The closing keynote was by Dimitri, who's been involved in the compiler development for a lot of Dotty. Dotty, yeah. Um, and he talked about like how things in your code can affect performance. I'm not sure I got that much out of that. Yeah, there were a few interesting numbers that I didn't know about. Hmm. Um, he's kind of talking about how some of the like, received wisdom that we have about performance is not really true anymore. Maybe it was true 20 years ago, and so everybody's just learned to believe it as fact, but compiled the CPUs have changed a lot in the last few years, so time to revisit some of those assumptions. Pardon? Did he give an example of what? Um, what was his example with the graphs? The three type. It was L1 cache lookup, yeah. and then in the middle was branch mispredict, and then mm -hmm. the other one was getting fetching something from main memory. So it was the time that these three operations take relative to each other. And so 20 years ago, um, fetching something. They were all basically the same, I think, 20 yeah. years ago. And then um, basically branch mispredictions got really, really cheap recently. So it's OK to mispredict branches. Generally, the compiler, or sorry, the CPU will just follow both branches and throw away whichever result is not needed. So fetching stuff from main memory is still really expensive. It's kind of hit the plateau. It can't get any cheaper. Uh, but L1 cache and branch mispredicts have got really, really fast. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, that was the big dinner. <laughs> I had the lamb, it was delicious. Um, just the keynote the next day, he was talking about this language called Unison, which he's building. Um, seems, I don't know, it's a pretty interesting language. It seems to be designed mostly for distributed systems. Um, so it lets you kind of say, take this little piece of computation here, this function, and compute it on that node over there. You can kind of send computations around as part of the language. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, you can kind of treat multiple computers as one in a way. And I think what I, as I understood it, you can basically program infrastructure. So like in your code, you could technically write like a load balancer and have that as packaging code. And basically you just say like run this here mm -hmm. or like swap it between nodes, moving computations. And he was talking about this technique called uh, partial Partial evaluation. Partial evaluation. Um, which is basically occurring. Yeah. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, basically, when you have multiple nodes and you need, need them to do something, you need to both send state that they need and some instructions to run. And instead of building his own JIT compiler, which will probably take a decade, uh, he reused the Java runtime and basically just built an ADT which has like a very specific set of instructions. And then the challenge was to uh, send that across to a node and then get it to compile fast enough for it to be usable. And to do that, you have this partial evaluation uh, technique. Um, and he said he got around one to two times the performance, like up to two times slower than just make, writing it in Java or Scala. Hmm and running it. So you can actually get code compiling inside a running JVM in about two times the, uh, or half the speed. So that's worth checking out. That's from Paul who wrote the red book together with Runar uh, as well. How was the presentation by Daniela? She was the one that Oh uh, yeah, she said hello. 
<laughs> I was sharing a cottage with her. Um, I didn't go to see that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I have seen it before. Sounds great. I've seen a video of it before, anyway. Uh, I went to see boring, enterprising webinars, <laughs> which was more fun than it sounds. So he was talking about how is Scala a good choice for kind of medium sized applications where you don't have a million users and 10,000 requests a second. You just have like a few users and you want to build a normal app. So that was pretty interesting. People don't really talk about that very much. But his conclusion is yes, Scala is still useful for that. And <laughs> maybe. And he gave a demo of Scala JS as well. Because he thinks it's worth having Scala on the back end and the front end. Just having one language to deal with. Especially if you don't have like dedicated front end guys. You just need to get stuff done. He thought it was very viable. Yeah. The next talk was Jan from um, Cake Solutions talking about this crazy thing they're building. It's a um, very high load, high traffic system. He said it goes from, it has these spikes of traffic where it goes from basically zero requests a second to 79 million requests in about 20 seconds. <laughs> so they need to <coughs> design things in a quite a unique way to deal with these kind of spikes. Um, so he was talking about event sourcing and uh, all kinds of stuff, really, kind of building big systems in general. Yeah, I think he he somehow validated the approach we're using with Kafka because mm. it felt very similar to exactly what we're doing. Except that we don't have 79 million requests a second. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. I heard some gossip about what that system actually is, but I'm not allowed to tell anybody. Uh, which one did you go to? The right one. Okay. Or yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Alexandra is the uh, one of the authors, the author of uh, Monix. Um, talked a bit about, I think the main takeaway was that he uses a lot of unpure uh, things behind the scenes in Monix, but exposes everything as a purely functional API. So this observable thing, which is the core, um, core thing in Monix, or core building block in Monix, basically is super impure under the hood, but you never actually see them. Uh, and that's how we is able to make it so fast. Um, not heard of anyone actually using Monix, but he said they built it to control power plants originally. Mm -hmm. That I think it works for Eon. And the Quintix. The Quintix. Um, or did they work for Eon? I, I don't know. Yeah. Did you get anything else from that talk? Uh, no, just the, reminded myself that I need to learn about Monix. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like very cool. The next one was Eric Toroboro, who makes the F library. And what else does he do? Specs. Oh, yeah, Specs too. And he's generally a useful guy. Um, so he was kind of implementing streaming library from scratch, from first principles. It was, it was really nice, I thought. Yeah, I think he recognized that all these libraries are kind of reinventing the same thing. So he tried to split the concerns into these three libraries, which one of them is F, and then two others he built from scratch. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah. If you like beautiful functional code, then that's a very satisfying video to watch, I think. Trends in open source, I missed this one. Yeah. I was dead by this stage. I think I looked briefly at the slides and it seems it's like a sell to companies to contribute more back to the open source and not treat it as a product. Treat it as like a team you're in that you're contributing back to. That's all I got. Type class induction. Um, 
this is really useful for anybody who's kind of struggling with shapeless, I think. If you're trying to do these kind of inductive implicits where you have a base case for H nil and then an inductive step for H cons, if you've ever tried to do that and not really understood it, this is a, a nice gentle introduction to that. Or even if you don't know much about type classes, it's also a good, good start, I think. Yeah. The arrow is really good at presenting, mm. so that's a good watch. He also demonstrated this really cool port of, uh, there's a library in Haskell called Servant, which he's sort of started porting to Scala, where you can encode the, it, it's a library for web servers, like a web framework, and you can encode the route that you're matching into the type, which is quite an interesting idea. So you build up a type which represents the whole kind of routing, the list of routes in your server. And then you just implement a piece of code for each bit, for each type, one for each route. How do you do that with uh, general lines? How do you write Yes. Yeah, I think that's what it uses in that. Oh, okay. Which you can kind of do in Scala. Yeah. Yeah, the DSL that he came up with looked quite nice. Yeah, and there was the talk about validating SQL that was for Cassandra specifically, I think, right? Yes. Um, so Tamer, he, well, he built a set of macros, but more importantly, a way to express using type classes that like how a database schema looks like and how your query looks like. And then like make sure at compile time that those two aligns. And what made it really powerful was the macro bit where you could like put a, a create table command in code and it would generate everything needed in Scala code to express that schema. And then when you run queries, it would verify that things actually exist. Like if you rename something, it will check the compile time that there is a column with that name. All of this assumes that you don't just dive into the database and start renaming columns. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and John's closing remarks were a bit of a tearjerker. We got very emotional. This kind of talking about the divisions that have been in the Scala community recently. There's a bit of, uh, there's some factions opening up and a bit of a rift happening. So he's trying to get us all to get along together. And then day three, uh, we had some type level workshops and uh, Scala Center spree, which is like a hackathon in the afternoon. So I did one workshop on Idris in the morning, which went okay, I think. Uh, just like 10 people sat around a table and I showed them some slides and they did some exercises, wrote some Idris code. And then for the second workshop, I did one on recursion schemes by Zainab, the same person who gave the talk on day one about recursion schemes. I learned about exciting things like zygomorphisms and post promorphisms. There's lots of cool words. Then. And then the afternoon was just that uh, Scala sent this free. Um, I did some work on Scala meta, uh, fixing a bug in their semantic DB, but then it didn't end up getting merged. It inspired somebody else to fix the bug in a slightly better way. But which then got merged. <laughs> so indirectly, I contributed. <laughs> and that was it. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah. Thank you.